morning we're reading from Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 46. Mark writes these words, they came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of God for the people of God. So last week, we were reading in Mark the story just before this one. A little different situation, though. These two brothers who were part of the band of 12 who were traveling with Jesus came to Jesus and said, Would you do something for us, anything we ask? And Jesus asked the same question that we heard today. What do you want me to do for you? They wanted seats of honor and glory at his right and at his left. They wanted to be exalted as they anticipated he was going to be exalted. And then Mark tells this story, which is a very different situation. And yet, when the man comes forward, Jesus asked the very same question. It was in verse 51 this week. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Apparently, Jesus thinks it's important that we are clear on our motivations and our desires when we come toward Jesus asking for help. What do you want from Jesus? What are you looking for in your life of faith? What do you think Jesus is going to be doing for you on this spiritual journey? What do you desire from your relationship with Jesus? These are important questions that clearly Jesus wanted people to think about when they were contemplating being a follower or asking for His help. Now the stories we've been reading through Mark, these who are coming to ask, And these who are following have heard him talk about things like the last will be first and the first will be last. And if you want to be a part of my kingdom and follow my way to life, you must be ready to be servant of all. And yet, those who have heard these words, who are traveling with Jesus, when they hear a man crying out for help and for mercy... Rather than springing over to him to see if they might help, they try to shush the man. They want him to be quiet. They're trying to hurry Jesus along. They're so focused on what Jesus might do next. But it seems like they have forgotten everything he's already done and said. Mark says it like this. In verse 48, after the man cries out for mercy, many sternly ordered him to be quiet. The crowd, or the followers, if you will, tried to seal off access to Jesus. This seems to be an ongoing phenomenon. Even in our day, people grow close to Jesus, and then they begin to think somehow they must protect him. From those who are not worthy. Sometimes we begin to think, do we want those kind of people in our church? Is that one welcome in our Sunday school class? 
Are we willing to respond to this one or that one that have needs or are looking for a place where someone might listen and love them? Sometimes we make the mistake of beginning to think we get to qualify people of being worthy to come close to Jesus and His family. But the Gospels make it clear that's not part of our role of discipleship. We are not the ones who decide who can draw close to Christ. As others have said, for those of us who pray the Our Father who art in heaven prayer, when we say Our Father, we're claiming to be part of a family, but often it's a much larger family than we realize when we say those words. The crowd, the followers, the many try to shut the man up. And Mark says, he'll have none of it. He yells all the louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Mark says, Jesus stood still and said, call him here. It's clear that this man is not part of the in-group. He's not described as a follower or a disciple. In fact, he couldn't even be part of the crowd because they are a traveling group. And he is sitting on the sidelines, immobilized, By his temporary blindness, the text seems to indicate that he used to be able to see, but not now. When it tells us he asked if he could see again, and once he does, it says he regained his sight. But at this moment in his life, he is struggling, just like all of us have ups and downs through the course of our lifetimes. We come to those places sometimes where we feel paralyzed or immobilized or so wounded That we're sitting on the sidelines, crying out for help, hoping somebody will hear us. This man has been sidelined. He's not only blind, Mark tells us, he's a beggar. He's trying to meet his needs, and now he's been marginalized so that all he can do is beg for some help. To meet his needs, however meager they might be. I began to wonder, where would I be in this story? Where would you be in the story? I mean, would you be one that was asking the man to be quiet? Would you want to shush him up? Would you try to protect Jesus from someone in need? Would you rush toward him and try to assist? Or would you move toward him and then as he screamed all the louder, think this guy may be crazy, maybe I should avoid him altogether? When I've run into people across my lifetime who are desperate and crying out, I've tried all those different strategies. It's hard to know what to do. When we run into a situation like this, especially in this day and age where we have large metropolitan areas and we know that some people who are asking for help are not really homeless. They're part of a network of people who are counting on those of us who are kind-hearted to be willing to give them money if they'll stand on the street corner or wander around the city and ask for help. So it's hard to know if it's a legitimate need or not. It's hard to know when someone's asking for food, if they're mentally stable or mentally ill. Are they really going to use the money for food? Or are they addicted and they're going to use it for something else that will not help them? Will not help them get better. Will not help them find a home. Will not help them have a full stomach. It's difficult to know. But we're very fortunate that in our city, 
There's a whole lot of nonprofit organizations, churches, and other religious institutions that are banding together to seriously address the problem of homeless people in Tulsa. Have you heard of this? 23 different organizations who have come together. It's called A Way Home for Tulsa. For us as United Methodists, it's led by our Restore Hope Ministries and the director, Jeff Janes. They do a great job. They are working together across the city to build a network and a safety net to identify the truly homeless and those in need and make sure that we respond. All of us as Tulsans have an opportunity to help make a difference in the lives of those people who are right now on the margins. And you know what they've discovered? The very best first step is to help these people have a place to call home, to have an address, to have a safe place to sleep at night. They find that if they can get them into a safe home situation, they do better at making their social work appointments and their medical appointments and taking their medication and beginning to get job training and all the things that help us have a more stable and healthy life. All of those happen more effectively once they have a place to call home so these organizations are working to make that happen they've already placed in the last three or four years hundreds of veterans and others who were formerly on the streets into safe housing now they continue to do that work but it's an effective way for any of us to participate in responding to those with needs who have been pushed to the margins in our society but there's another lesson here i think for us as well a little broader lesson in terms of our own christian discipleship as jesus demonstrates in our story today he is sensitive and responsive to those coming toward him he is ready to include any who want to join in the disciple band any who want to join in this movement of following christ a pastor recently shared the story of this 84-year-old woman that began to come to her small church. She had never been there before, but one Sunday they had advertised in their community that they were going to have a holiday brunch. She heard the ad, so she showed up. She was ready to eat. But you know, the pastor said once she met some people and enjoyed the brunch, she came back the next Sunday and the next Sunday and the next Sunday. And she became a regular part of that church family. Then she began to stay after services and ask the pastor questions about faith and theology. You could tell she was seriously trying to understand what it meant to be a disciple of Christ. In fact, she had so many questions that some of the other church members got annoyed that she was taking so much time from the pastor because they wanted to talk to the pastor as well. The pastor found out she had began, begun to read some of the great theological books from some of our best Christian theologians, and she had questions. And I can tell you, if you read those books, you're going to have some questions. <laughs> you're going to need to talk to a pastor or somebody else who's thought about these questions about life and faith, and this woman had. And after they got to know each other, finally this woman asked if she could be baptized at that church. And the pastor baptized the woman and afterward commented that this woman knew what she wanted Jesus to do for her. She knew that because the woman wrote her a letter, a portion of which read like this. Often, I think about Jesus when I have a particular difficulty with people. I think of Jesus coming into the room with me. I do not need to explain to him who I am. He understands. He sees an ancient person scorned, often misunderstood. I know what he would say. I have no doubt. I know he would understand all that I cared about with such great passion was to speak the truth and to live the truth. She had heard 
the message of Christ. And she wanted to change her life, so she lived in concert with the way that he taught us all about. We've been talking about that message this month around our theme phrase, you're an important piece of our puzzle. You're an important piece of the Boston Avenue family. You're an important piece of the Christian family. Here at the church, we want everybody to know the love of Christ alive in their lives. Whether they came here 50 years ago or came here 50 minutes ago. We want to be a people through which God can work and reveal the love of Christ to any and all who are crying out in need. We can be those people. We can say to each other and to all that come, you are an important piece of our puzzle. Recently, we've had a long-term vision team working on this. They've written it this way for us. They said, Boston Avenue United Methodist Church seeks to be a thoughtful Christian community that connects all people with God's unconditional love. And you don't always get to see it happening the way I do. You probably didn't see the mother and daughter who were here a couple of weeks ago who said to me, we want to join the church. I had never met them before. But the daughter had come and was a part of our Sistema Orchestra, and that's how they were introduced to the congregation. And then they were able to come to worship, and the daughter had been in youth group activities. They said, we're ready to join. Well, that's fabulous. We're able to say to them, join us. You're an important piece of our puzzle. And truly they are. You don't get to see the couple that used to be here every Sunday, but then years ago sort of began to let other things get in the way until finally they told me, we've just been watching on TV. Oh, we watch every Sunday. But because we've been talking about our 125th anniversary and how important it is for all of us to come together, they're coming again now to the building to be a part of worship, to be a part of the life of Christ alive in this place. You don't get to see the people who watch on TV that call me, that write to me, telling me how vital a lifeline we are to them, particularly when they are homebound. I'm thinking of one particular couple who called a few months ago. I did not know them at all, but they knew another one of our church members, and she helped us get connected. I was able to call and talk with them on the phone and then go over to the house for a visit. We pray for them. They pray for us. They particularly like to pray for our youth. They even offered a prayer in the Pray Your Peace prayer emphasis book that we've been using over these last 30 days or so. They're vitally engaged now in the life of the congregation. Other congregation members and staff have talked with them and gone by their home. They're an important piece of our puzzle. They're an important piece of the Boston Avenue family. They're an important piece of the Christian family. And whenever we can reach out in those kinds of ways, I think we're modeling and following exactly what Jesus demonstrates and reveals to us in the reading today when he's so ready to listen and respond. People all around are crying out, let's be like Jesus. Let us be like Jesus Let's be that church family that stops to listen and respond to the needs of others. Let us broadcast and proclaim it loud and clear. You're an important piece of our puzzle. You're an important piece of the Boston Avenue family. You are an important piece of the Christian family. Amen.